welcome folks who are here. Um, this is the um, public information session about uh, large scale solar facilities bylaws in Conway. And we are, um, the planning board is opening, is opening this meeting. So we need to actually, first somebody has to move. So I move that we open this meeting and um, somebody want to second that and then we'll vote, the planning board will vote to open this as, because this is a open meeting, public meeting. Um, so somebody, Beth, um, Hmm. You're hearing you typing when you're oh, sorry. Uh, muted. So okay. actually, I would ask, actually, that's a good I'm point. I'm going to mute. Sorry. Please mute unless you're speaking. But can I get somebody to put their two fingers up to say they're seconding this motion? Susan seconded. And then um, planning board members, raise your hand if we're officially, you, you know, opening this meeting. Great. Thank you very much. So, um, so welcome, um, folks. And so I'm Mary McClintock. I'm a member of the planning board. And um, I want to introduce the members of the planning board for folks who don't know us. And I also want to point out that, um, yeah, so I want to introduce us. So I'm Mary McClintock. I'm a member. Beth Gershman, who is waving her hand about, is the chair of the planning board. Um, Jen Mullins, uh, who is waving her hand about, is the uh, vice chair. Susan Fenton is a member of the planning board. She's waving her hand about. Bill uh, Mabius is waving his hand about. And then Joe Strugowski is our fabulous and wonderful associate member of the planning board. Um, everybody else is fabulous and amazing, but Joe's the fabulous and amazing associate member. Um, so I wanna point out that we are recording this meeting. I wanna point out that I know Mary Byrne is here from the recorder. Um, and we want to thank Mary for the article that she did to help people find out about this meeting. Um, are there any other folks from the media present? Um, any other folks from the media? Okay, so just be aware that there are folks from the media, that Mary's here from the recorder. Um, please stay muted um, unless you're called upon to speak. Um, it doesn't look like we have anybody on the like, you know, telephone right now that everybody is in Zoom. So. Um, but I can explain how to mute and unmute on the phone if we need to do that. We are going to take questions and comments um, after we're going to, the, the plan for the evening. I'm doing a little intro blurb and, you know, you know, housekeeping. I'll give a little brief intro to the evening. Then Beth is going to give us a general overview of the kinds of revisions to the um, large scale solar facilities um, bylaw that um, we've been thinking about. And then, um, then we're, and there's going to be sort of a list of points. And then we're going to go through each of those points. Um, after she does the overview, then we're going to say, okay, point number one. Um, does anybody have questions or comments about point number one? We'll take questions and comments about that. Then there's going to be point number two. Does anybody have questions or comments about that point? Um, so we're going to do that process. Um, we would ask that you, um, um, you know, as you have comments and questions that they can be, that we'll be basically getting those, we'll be asking people who want to say something to put their name in the chat when we get to that point. And then we'll collect that, those lists of that names and we'll go through the order of people to speak. Um, I definitely want to point out to you that um, this is an opportunity for us to offer some information, gather some information, but there's also the opportunity for anybody who's here or not here to send written comments or questions to the um, planning board, um, you know, and we'll tell you more about how to do that. Susan, you have a point that you'd like to make. Yeah, I just wanted to say that when you um, come up to make your comment or ask your question, if you could state your name and your where you live in Conway, that would be really helpful to us. Yeah. Uh, and also, um, there is going to be a vacancy on the Conway Planning Board this uh, coming election. So if you're inspired by your involvement, that's how I got involved was when we were working on the marijuana bylaws. So if you're inspired by your involvement, um, please consider joining the planning board. It's a very productive committee and um, a nice bunch of people. Yeah, so, and fun. And, fun. and I'm, the per <laughs> I'm the person who's not running again 
and I'm doing that because of busyness in my life, but I'm actually going to follow my role model, Joe Strugowski, and hopefully become an associate member to stay involved, but not be a full voting member. Because we have so much fun. Because, because this is a very fun group to hang out with. And that is the word that keeps coming up again and again. Yes, yes. So anyway, thanks, Susan, for that. So do people have, um, oh, and do people have uh, questions about the flow of the evening? Questions about the flow of the evening, pretty clear. If you have a question about the flow of the evening, unmute yourself and ask it. Otherwise, we're moving ahead. Okay, ready to go. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, this information session, like any information session that we do, is an opportunity for the board to both present information and to get inf input on important concerns that have for the potential to impact our entire community. So tonight, the, what we're focusing on specifically are issues related to the large scale solar bylaw, solar facilities bylaw, and our bylaw related, uh, large scale solar facilities and our bylaw related to them. We will present information about our current large scale solar bylaw, as well as some possible revisions to that bylaw. We're gonna have plenty of time for questions and comments. And we are gathering information to help the planning board draft the revisions to the large scale solar bylaw. Then we're gonna have a, the planning board is gonna present those draft revisions at a public hearing on Wednesday, March 24th, Wednesday, March 24th, from 7 to 9 p.m. via Zoom. So what we're this is gathering information to help us write a draft of a proposed bylaw. We then bring it to public hearing, um, get input, do revisions, and then as a as a planning board, we take that public input, we do whatever revisions, and then we bring the um, propo the proposed revisions to town meeting. That's the overall process. So please mark your calendars for March 24th, 7 to 9 p.m. for more fun and games with <coughs> Life Park with the planning group, with us here. So um, is that clear? Um, and I think, oh, I, th I think the, you know, the only other thing I want to say, and we're going to say it probably a bunch of times um, this evening, is that what we're talking about is large scale solar facilities and that does not, the, what we're talking about has nothing to do with residential scale solar facilities um, or solar, you know, people having uh, solar things out in their yard or on their roof as in residential size scale. We're not talking about that. Beth, um, so just wanna be clear what we're talking about. Um, Beth is gonna give us a general overview of the types of revisions and um, I can share my screen with your, do you want me to share my screen with that? Yeah, I think, think that'd be helpful to share your screen. For okay. Everybody. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, so um, can people see my screen now? I can. That um, has the revisions to the large scale. Can I, if, if you can't see it, wave your hand about or Okay, Beth, it's yours. Okay, go for it. Thank you, Mary. So um, I'm just going to speak briefly about how the planning board got to this point in time. Um, one of the things that came up as we were um, working through the process for uh, the site review for the Nexamp property was giving us an opportunity to look closely at our existing bylaw. And once we started doing that and we started hearing from abutters, um, several of us also took a look at our neighbors and our uh, valley towns and took a look at what their bylaws for large scale solar look like. So we have read a lot of bylaws a lot of bylaws. Um, we've also read the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission Best Practices Guide for Large Scale Solar, which was published in 2020. And we've had conversations with people uh, on the planning board in Ashfield and in Waitley. Waitley recently in the summer did pass a revision to their bylaw based on their um, own 
town concerns, which are, you know, similar to ours, but not identical to ours in any way. Um, but the both of those uh, pieces of both of those towns have uh, been very helpful to us when we look when we look at bylaws and possible bylaw revisions. So if you look at the screen and you see that the revisions we are considering, so we are considering these revisions. We're talking about them tonight with interested people. We're accepting comments on them. Um, and then we're gonna have a public hearing to talk more about these considerations. These are not the only considerations. These are the ones that we thought we would have. These are the most, I'm not sure what the word would be here. Uh, these are the, these are, these are pretty important to me. These are priorities. Um, so the first thing up on this screen is require the special permit process and a site plan review for all proposed new large solar facilities over five acres. Currently, our bylaw does not allow for, it's not requiring a special permit process. It requires a site plan review, but not a special permit process. A special permit process gives um, the planning board and, and uh, the citizens of a town a, a little, some more ability to look closely at any, any proposed project and um, make changes to it possibly and you know take a look at the impact in a different way. The other uh, thing that we're going to focus on is increasing setback distances from the array from the proposed solar array perimeter to any abutters. Um, that's something that a number of towns have done and I and and some of the abutters to from the NAXAM site have, have also raised this concern. We're considering strengthening requirements for sound testing and for source of noise to be further from the perimeters. So there's not a moving, lot of moving parts in a solar array, but the, the parts that would, that would create the noise, we'd like them to be located farther away from the perimeter of the, of the array. We would require construction site monitoring, which of course would be paid for by the, any applicant for any, uh, all proposed projects over five acres. Um, right now, uh, people will know that we have, we have monitoring, it's specifically for stormwater management. This would be another sort of layer of monitoring over, over that as well. We, we are considering requiring a line of sight visibility testing prior to permitting. So uh, you can come in with your drawings, but we'd really like to see exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about what the line of sight would be and um, increasing sort of like uh, just <laughs> juicing up the screening and planting and maintenance of any plant screening over the life of array. Um, this is a uh, part of our bylaw now that we're requiring um, vegetative screening uh, to, keep, to keep a solar array out of sight of abutters and from public roadways. This would, um, this would increase that and also uh, uh, require that they may be maintained over the life of the array, which is typically 20 years. So as Mary said, we're gonna go point by point here um, because I think that makes the most sense. Right. Just so what I think, the whole what I think I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do, Beth, is just as a process comment is I'm gonna stop screening sharing and then I will put each, um, like each point in the chat so people can see this is the one we're talking about now. Um, uh, uh, and um, and what, what I would ask is that people, um, actually um, what, I, what I would ask for a process for how we do this is um, what I think worked pretty well before was if people had a, um, uh, if people have a comment or a question they wanna make to put your name in the chat. And then I would ask Susan or Jen, one of you to keep a list of who those people are and message them to me or something. Cause I'm, I'm gonna be trying to facilitate and call on people and it's harder for me to keep track of the chat. So if people could, if you if you are interested in um, 
in have you know making a, a, a comment or a question then please put it in the chat susan um would you keep track and yeah then just i'll keep track That'd i'll be keep great. track and i'll let you know who's next on the list after the person is finished talking so just y'all you don't have to put your actual question in the chat just put your name in the chat and then we'll have an order of people that um will proceed through that'd be great that'd be great thank you thank you so the i'm just going to pull up that first question um the first thing we were talking about this is the special permit um is requiring a special permit process so I'm putting this in the chat right now. So this this point that we're going to take questions or comments about is the special permit um, process, um, and we'll take one you know comment or question per person, and you know to make you know sure that everybody gets a chance. So does um, if you have if you're interested in um, if you're interested in making a comment or question, please put something in the chat. Let us know that. Not so Mary. Jack, Jack Farrell said that he's interested in making a comment, I believe. Okay, and then Jeff Golay. Okay, and then Jeff so Farrell. Jack and then Jeff. Okay, uh, thanks Mary and Susan. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I definitely think there should be a special permit process, obviously, uh, living up near here and seeing what it's done. Do you um, mind introducing yourself and telling us where you live? Yeah, it's Jack Farrell, as it says on the screen there. And uh, I live on Main Poland Road. Thanks. Um, so I support this uh, special permit review, of course. Also, similarly to uh, when when new cannabis cultivation projects are launched or proposed, I believe there's a required community uh, forum on that. This sort of um, for the proponent to come forward and discuss what they want to do. Uh, and that's prior to the permitting process. And I think that would be a good idea on something like this. Um, it, would, it would have been helpful for us up here to know what to expect, to really get a handle on how this would affect the neighborhood, certainly for my neighbors who have, are taking this on the chin a little bit. Um, I think it would have been helpful. Uh, you know, people might have said, hey, why don't we sell? Let's get the heck out of here now or, or whatever. Um, and I think it would have been more neighborly, you know, had the had the owners of that land um, done something like that. Thanks, thanks, Jack. And want to point out that the what's what the in with the marijuana um, um, that community meeting is a requirement of state law, and there is not a parallel requirement related to um, to large scale solar. Um, there is. And I think I, what we did with NextAMP is, um, and with a, well, with a special permit process, there would be information sessions and public hearings and stuff. But what I'm hearing is that when it first gets brought up, and maybe even before the permit application, that there be some kind of community meeting. So we could consider that. We can certainly consider that. Um, Jeff, Jeff was next, then Alice, and then Jerry. Hi there, I'm Jeff Golay, 2300 Main Poland Road. We are direct abutter to the Next Ant project. It is what we see when we look out our windows now. And um, we are very upset by this project. Um, we are directly impacted by it. And we essentially, by the time we knew that it was happening, it, it was designed and ready to go. And they really didn't change a whole lot between the initial planning board meeting and what they built now. I mean, there were changes, but you know, basically by the time we find out about it, it was, you know, they, they were planning on clearing, you know, as close as they could to our property. And, um, and yeah, I, I'm a land surveyor. I work in the development industry. I've worked on solar arrays. So I, I know what these things look like and I know how these processes typically go. And I am a absolute supporter of requiring a special permit so that the town and perhaps neighbors can have a little bit more input on this process because it really felt like we were kind of, and still are um, at like next Sam's will and not even like, because basically, you know, the way this works is the developer offers millions of dollars to the landowner and the landowner signs a lease and the landowner's out of it. So there's no neighborly anything really. Once, once they dangle all those millions of dollars in front of the landowner, there's no neighborly considerations anymore. So um 
you know, for us, we bought our house six years ago. We were excited to move to a wooded neighborhood. At that time, Maine Poland Road had no broadband internet. We still have no cell service here. You know, we were moving kind of to the wilderness and it's shocking only yeah. six years later to now be next to a, a multi-million dollar industrial facility. And it frightens me that the current bylaw has no density requirements whatsoever. So our neighborhood has essentially three landowners who own almost all the land that create the aesthetic and wildlife natural quality of our neighborhood. Basically three landowners own almost all the land and a bunch of us own, you know, we own five acres, not a tiny amount, but we thought it seemed like a whole lot more of a buffer than it really is once they start clearing, you know, 400 feet away is actually not that far, it turns out. You can see it from our house. So um, it's really frightening to think, oh, if the farmer down the road wants to develop solar, then that's what we're gonna look by at when we drive down the road is just a giant array there and another one behind our house. And if one more landowner across the street wanted to develop, then essentially the whole neighborhood's shot. And now it's not Conway beautiful natural setting. It's you're in an industrial development zone that still doesn't have cell service, <laughs> um, you know, but anyway, so from my perspective, um, it would be great to have a little more protection for the, you know, the things that people move to Conway for. They don't move to Conway to be in an, an industrial you know, development. So um, um, I think that's yeah. and just real, real quick. I it says for over five acres, but what's the limit? Like how? What's the maximum size they can go? Or can we make some restrictions on how large the solar arrays can be? Because other towns have capped it at ten acres of clearing forest, no more than ten acres, like Belcher Town no more than 20 acres inside a fenced in flat area or whatever like we need to have restrictions on how big they can be and also that's that's it that's for the special permit so wanted to make sure that we had a limit with the special permit okay so, thanks thank you. thanks jeff and that thank you and that brings up a really good point is that we presented beth presented a, a set of points and then there's also could be whole other topics and we will get to those after we've gone through those points so thank you for reminding me of that. Um, Alice, you were next. Alice, you need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm Alice Vigliani. I live on Maine Poland Road, not an abutter to the array, but I see it all the time and I've been very much affected by it in several ways. Um, I'll second everything that my neighbors have said so far, and there are going to be a number of points that I think all of us are going to want to add more to as this meeting goes on. But right now, in terms of the um, special permit for over five acres, I'm actually wondering if it has to be as small as five acres or if it could be perhaps reduced to something like three. And the reason I'm asking is because you folks on the planning board have looked at other towns. Do they have a minimum size that's less than five acres? And in my particular case, I have an immediate neighbor who is most likely going to be putting her land up for sale in the coming year. There are probably three or four acres of open land on that property. And if someone should buy that and want to put a solar array on that land, I don't want to have to see that. And I would like to see the um, considerations that you're giving to the large arrays be effective on a smaller scale if something like that should happen right next door to me. So does it have to be five? Could it be less than five? And that's all I'll mention for right now, but I would like to come back later. I have a number of other points to bring right. up. And we're, thank you. And yes, and we're gonna be going through the different points and then we'll get to the things that weren't on the points. So um, thanks. And then Jerry was next. Thank you, uh, Jerry LeBlanc, 2332 Main Poland Road. Um, I am in a butter to the next amp project. Um, I'm in total agreement with the idea of um, requiring the special permit. So let that be registered. Um, and the question I had was, does this then um, 
remove effectively the the section about as of right citing is that what the purpose of this change is going to be is to to uh because it seems like the as of right citing um clause in the bylaw is what is is the problem and it doesn't have any limitations or size you know um definitions or anything like that so that was my question and i just um, want to say that uh, I had written out my sort of thoughts about um, what some of those limits would be and five acres was the number that I came to as well. I felt like it was reasonable. Um, so I'm really pleased to see these bullet points uh, on the screen tonight. So that's it for now. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. And um, I think the mention of as of right citing in our current bylaw is on is for what's called the solar overlay district, which is, no, Susan is going to correct me on so, that. Yeah, so there are two as of right um, issues. Currently, you're absolutely right, Jerry. Currently, the bylaws allow for um, uh, a solar, a solar array with simply a, um, a site plan review. The as of right siting goes also to what's called the solar overlay district, which is a collection of four properties um, town owned properties scattered throughout the town. And those are a matter of, um, uh, it's in the bylaws that, that that map exists. And we are going to actually be moving to amend that and take one of those properties out. But that's what that refers to as as of right. Right, right. Um, and so does anyone else have anything to, questions or comments about this first, um, this first, uh, point which was requiring a special permit process. Joe. Joe. I, I just want to further clarify the as of right. That there's basically today three ways that we deal with issues like this. As of right means that you basically go to the building inspector and get your permit. <coughs> um, this, would, this applies to uh, what we're proposing or what we'll talk about later is for the residential owner you just have to comply with our bylaws. You go to the building inspector, he issues you a permit. That would, in our mind, would be something like 25 kilowatts. This one is six megawatts, which is 5,000 kilowatts. Um, then the next level typically is as by right with a site plan review. So there is, uh, you talked earlier about having an information hearing, but site plan review basically fills that position. You, the applicant has to present his project to the town and to the planning board. He, he can do the project provided he complies with the bylaws, but he has to go through the site plan review process and share that information with the town. We're proposing that for the small, let's call them industrial commercial projects. And then the other Under, level- It's up, up to an acre, up to an acre and a quarter, right, Joe? Up to an acre and a quarter, right? Yeah. And then the last level, uh, which is about 250 kilowatts is where this starts, is the special permit. So that gives the town, not only do you have to comply with the bylaw, but you have to satisfy all the requirements for a special permit, which talks about impact on the neighborhood and all these other, there's eight or nine things that are listed there, environmental effects. So it, and the planning board could in fact reject your project. It's very difficult to reject a project when it's by right or by right with a special permit. I mean, with a site plan review, but, but with, a, with a special permit, there are actually, for certain conditions, you could reject the project. So those are sort of the three levels that we're working with. And those are pretty typical in most towns today, at least. I hope that clarifies it rather than confuses it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Um, and any other comments or questions related to that first point about spe requiring a special permit? Or should we go on to the next point and questions and comments about that? Ready to go? Okay. So I am just put that second, the next point is in the chat. It's about increasing setback distances from the array perimeter to abutters. So if people have a question or comment about that, stick your name in the chat and we'll call on you. Um, please, pardon me. Today would have been my mother's hundredth birthday, and she oh, just God told me that I had to say please there. 
Sorry. Um, I, it would be Jerry and then Devlin. Yeah, I just want to be on record at saying yes. I 100% I, I approve and agree that, you know, further setbacks or greater setbacks is a great um, place to amend the bylaw to increase the distance. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Devlin. I agree with Jerry 100% um, being a butters. Um, just want to just dis discuss the distance of how, how far back to get that figured out. But I agree, definitely. Yeah, and I would add, um, in this case, I believe the project has exceeded the minimum setback requirements. I mean, the minimum setback is 50 feet. And I, I know they're more than 50 feet from our our property line, at least, you know, and that setback, maybe to clarify, that setback is actually to the panels, correct? Like, what is that setback to? Typically, from a surveying perspective, that would be to the panels, not to the limit of clearing, which is very significant in terms well, of the impact on us. Yeah, uh, this, the setback, you're right, the bylaws that I have read um, actually talk about setback from the array, which would be the panels. Yeah, so not the so, fence, wow. not the limited clearing. The um, right. Wow. So if in our case, if the panels actually were 50 feet from our property line, it would be much, 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 much more of a visual impact than it is. Um, I'm not actually sure what the setback is that they held to. There were some, in our, for us, there were some wetlands that pushed them back just a little bit more, but, but it's still, you know, uh, so yeah, we would definitely encourage further setbacks. And in the case of like this specific project, now of course every project's different and you kind of just have to come up with a setback number for the bylaw. But in this case, um, what is especially offensive is that the landowner owns enough land that they could have configured the project so that we so that it didn't impact us. And they chose to do it the easy way that'll make the most money. So I know you can't really have variable setbacks, but it's like when a project could be done for less impact, boy, it would be nice if you could just say, you can still make the same amount of money, you know, you can still generate as many megawatts, but, or kilowatt, whatever, um, but do it in a way that, you know, is the maximum setback, you know, that you can still do your project. So I know that's kind of wishy-washy, but at least as an abutter, that's what I would have loved to have seen in this case was them, you know, um, take a holistic approach to it. And the large, just to add one more thing, the large scale industrial and commercial facility zoning bylaws is a minimum of 750 feet setback from a um, property. So I think that would be a good number to put, put potentially consider. Just throwing that out there too. And also, yeah, with the line of sight testing. Okay. That's all. Thanks. Um, thanks for those comments and um, want to be clear that the large scale industrial um, bylaw is for a 50 acre minimum project. So it's a little different scale that we're talking about. But and what I would say is if you have particular like, thank you for that specific suggestion. If you have particular like detailed in the weeds kind of suggestions for like the numbers in you know, or in the draft of the revisions, that's a perfect thing to email us about at planningboard of at townofconway.com so that we can take those into consideration. That's a perfect example. Um, if you say, if you want to do, you know, it should be X number of acres or it should be X number of feet setback or that kind of thing, planningboard at townofconway.com. Um, are there other folks who want to talk about increased setback distance or ask questions about that? Mary, I just want to note that Jack Farrell in the chat said that he was in support of increasing the setback distances, but did not need to speak personally. Okay, thank you. And um, thank you. Okay, then. Um, are anybody else gone once, gone twice? Um, okay, so the next topic is, and our points is, I just put in the chat, and it's strengthening the requirements for sound testing and for source of noise to be further from perimeters. So if folks have comments or questions on that, please put your, um, put your name in the chat and I'll call on you. Um, I see I Jeff, Jeff, Jeff yeah. is first. Um, anybody else put your name down? So Jeff, go for it. Yeah, the, the sound thing is actually, to me, one of the most 
worrying things about this project that we still don't actually know anything about because it's not you know the pro it's not live yet they're they're not hooked up generating power yet um so uh i'm fairly sensitive to noise i'm a musician i have sensitive ears or whatever and um i am really concerned <laughs> you know like if we can hear a humming from our house we're moving and good luck if we can even sell the place um but it just terrifies me to think of that. And I remember Jerry asked questions at the very first planning board meeting about this project, about, you know, what kind of, um, specifically because he has the, the pole farm near his house, you know, is there going to be noise coming off of that equipment? And I don't know if anybody really got a good answer to that. Um, but, you know, like, um, I mean, we were promised that we wouldn't be able to see the project and we can. So if they say we can't hear it, um, I'm really terrified that we actually will be able to. So just as an abutter, that's to me one of the most scary concerns that could really ruin the quality of life here in a you know unique, disturbing way. So that's and, then, yeah. and I can hear the guys, like one person just like walking around talking with his buddies and swearing and like oh, yeah. shooting the, the SHIT, my daughter's here. Just like I can hear them like from my porch, just like talking and through, laughing this is through about 400 feet of woods there's a big vertical drop so it's like they're up on the hill and we can hear everything they say all the time here you know not to mention the construction noise but we know that's temporary yeah it's um, really okay thank you. Thank thanks you. That. thank you for that alice yeah um jeff mentioned the pole farm uh where i live i don't hear any noise from the location of the array, the array we could hear the installation noise this summer and we certainly heard the semi trucks going up and down the road in front of our house all the time but the pole farm which i guess is what you call the um transfer station the generating station i don't know what you call it that is currently going to be constructed at the bottom of the newman's driveway right on the edge of main poland road uh two questions you know is that going to be generating noise while it's generating the electricity and i think of that so does my husband as being part of this entire project and we don't even want to be looking at that it's not completely constructed we don't know what it's going to look like when it's completely um finished but we are surprised that it's right in plain sight and we don't understand why that couldn't have been installed up at the top of the neighbor's driveway right on the edge of the array and then one power line brought down to the road where it's going to run out to Williamsburg Ashfield Road. In fact, we wondered why that couldn't have been situated so that it runs directly out okay. onto Alice, South Ashfield Alice, Road. Alice, I'm just going to interrupt for a second here because what we're discussing tonight will have no impact on the current NEXAMP project. What we're discussing tonight is revising the solar bylaws. So what, what, so I'm, if, hearing, if, wait, what I'm hearing from you is that concerns about noise from all the different parts of a site are something that should be taken into consideration in a special, if we were having a special permitting process about other, other pro, you know, that that's a place where there could be noise issues. And what I'm hearing is support from you from this idea of strengthening requirements for sound testing and for the source of noise. Um, so that I hear the concerns about this existing project and they sound very challenging and they're giving us useful information to say in perhaps a future special permit process, where are the different parts of a project and where's, what's the noise issues related to those and where are they cited? All of that could be in a future process, but in, for what, but, and I appreciate you using that example, but I wanna go on to have other people talk about all these different points, because unfortunately we cannot in this, um, in this meeting, in this process, uh, you know, address that particular issue um, around, you know, and I, yeah, I apologize about that, but that's the, the current reality. Does okay, that make that's sense? that's fine. That's fine, but it's something to consider. Yes. Thank you. Yes, and it's very helpful for us to hear that as part of the things to consider in writing uh, the bylaw. 
uh, revising the bylaw. So then I heard Jerry was next. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I definitely I'm in favor of more testing for you know noise uh, that's generated by the facility. I'm wondering if that also includes um, noise generated during the construction phase. Um, at, so two things on that, just like Jeff, I mean, when they turn this thing on, I really, if there's a hum or if I'm like living with, you know, some low level frequency of electric power being generated, it's really going to bum me out. But that's sort of something we haven't, that remains to be seen. But something that has been seen and that really did affect me because I'm the closest to butter was the, the trucking and the construction noise that occurred during the construction phase that didn't have any regulation in the bylaws on the hours of operation when they are allowed to do construction. Um, whereas in some of the other bylaws, like the large scale industrial facility has a 7 a.m. to I think 5 p.m window and no holidays and no weekends. Um, this construction project violated all of those. They were there on holidays, they were there on weekends, they were there at 5 and 5 a.m. There were 18 wheel trucks, you know, idling on Main Poland Road at 5 a.m. waiting for, you know, some contractor or whatever to show up and receive their load. Um, the trucks that came by my house during the logging phase with air brakes, um, it was not air brakes, uh, engine brakes, it was really the worst. So I'm just wondering if, if that proposed change is gonna also include noise during construction phase. Okay, that's something that will, that's, this is all exactly the kind of information we're looking for is the kind of specifics that would be helpful to have in, a re, in revisions to the bylaw and these recommendations, so thank you. And are there other folks who wanna comment on this strengthening the requirements for sound testing or source of noise being further from perimeters? Any going once, going twice. Anybody else? Okay, now we're going to the next topic and I'm putting- hey, Mary, Mary, I think Jack wanted to say something. Okay then, Jack. I, I actually, if people want to say something, if you haven't put your name in the chat or haven't waved, you know, please put your name in the chat. If you think you want to say something, even if two other people are still talking, if you put your name in the chat, we'll get it quicker. So yeah, go ahead, so Jack. He just put his name in. Yeah. Um, it's not coming to everyone, Jack. Please don't send it just to Susan. Put it to everyone. Okay. Um, the uh, yeah, I just want I support whatever everybody else is saying. Uh, just to just to go back to um, it was either conservation commission or the planning board. I remember asking Ethan Giles, "What kind of noise will this generate?" I understand there's some sort of thing. And he says, "Oh, you know, no, you won't hear it from the road." Um, and part of me was like, yeah, "I'm a reporter, so I'm I'm at these kind of meetings all the time, and developers say this stuff, and you know, and then three months later, there's like all kinds of issues. Sometimes I shouldn't say all the time, but." Uh, so I was like, uh, yeah, let's see, let's see about that. So I, I just want to really support that because, you know, the, the developers do not live here and, and they have no idea exactly how this will affect the neighborhood. And, that, and that's all I wanted to say. That's, I think it's really important to get a noise demonstration. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Jack. And yes, if you, and just to clarify that not just for Jack, but anybody, if like, like if you, if you're interested in you know, making a comment or question as we move along, it's it's helpful for me to see it in the to everyone um, or, you know, and then Susan can be maybe grabbing them, but anyway. So onward to the next one, require suck construction site monitoring paid by the applicant for all proposed projects over five acres. So as, as we said earlier, we currently have um, in the current project, there's a requirement for, um, um, there's a requirement for um, um, stormwater management monitoring that was part of the site plan review process. Um, this would make for a broader construction site monitoring that isn't just about um, the, uh, the stormwater management. So I see that Devlin, and then Jerry, um, 
have comments? Yeah, thank you, um, Devlin at 2300 Main Poland Road. Um, I found a bunch of litter um, on our property and on our stream on multiple occasions. So I think that there needs to be somebody that is walking the perimeter and making sure that they do a good job of, of keeping their debris in check. I found, I took photographs and sent it to the planning board. There were some rather large pieces of styrofoam that escaped and other just like um, smaller pieces of litter from the workers, um, hand warmer wrappers, pop tarts, wrappers, um, ha uh, ham and chips or whatever, the pork, pork rinds. Pork rinds um, <laughs> And yeah, um, like the, the cable zip ties bag was in our stream um, and other large plastic bags that small animals can go in and suffocate. My, my dog actually um, two or three weeks ago when we were walking back there, picked up a Mott's applesauce wrapper and could have choked on it or could have eaten it. And we had to chase her down for it. So it's just not acceptable. And um, Jamie said, oh, once the fence is developed it'll hopefully contain the the, the the litter if any is to escape escape the receptacle but it's like you're designing a fence that has like a six inch uh open space on the bottom like litter is still going to be able to blow out underneath the fence if it, it's not going to stay there i'm sorry the fence isn't going to unless it's like a big another big styrofoam um piece of trash but i just i really want to make sure that they are held accountable for the litter and um, find appropriately if they are um, violating the um, basically I don't know what the what are the, the law littering laws and also they're right by wetlands they wanted to clear up so close to it and if there's litter blowing in there they need to be held accountable for okay and um, to add to that from a land surveyor perspective um, I've been a surveyor during the construction phase of arrays and I do a lot of surveys of as built um, as built surveys for these arrays. And they are almost never constructed the way they are designed. And they build the panels in different places. The fence is outside the lease area. The road isn't where it was supposed to be. Things get screwed up a lot. And part of the reason is because actually a lot of these solar development companies don't, a lot of them are very new companies without a lot of experience. And um, Nexamp is an older company, but um, it would be great to have, to feel like there was some kind of, like somebody actually looking at the site plan and be like, are, is this actually what you're building right now? Because usually when we go through and do the as built, we're like, wow, this is really different. Okay, we got to go back to the landowner and re get a new lease because we built all this stuff outside the lease. And um, I doubt that there's any kind of oversight like that going on on this project right now. So that's my piece. Thank you. Um, Jerry, you're next. Thank you. Yes, I, I want to also report just, just like Devlin that trash and litter was uh, you know, a real insult um, to, to find blown trash off of the property. On more than one occasion, I notified Nexamp um, and got basically lip service. So if, if um, construction site oversight um, is gonna regulate things like that, I'm all in favor of it. And to add to that, another component was there were a couple of days where we had a lot of particulate matter that was descending upon our property. I have photographic evidence. Um, I mean, I couldn't breathe out there. I was having lunch with my beloved and we had to come inside because we were choking from all of the stone dust that was in the air that was just coming down like, like visible clouds. So, you know, the environmental, um, you know, oversight of that kind of stuff on the construction site seems really important to me. Um, and, you know, I did report that to the, uh, you know, the Nexam contact, she apologized, um, you know, it happened more than once, you know, what, what could I do, you know, but so if more construction site oversight is going to help with things like that, I'm all for it. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Jerry. Jack was next, then Alice, then Devlin. Jack, are you still there? I think Jack may have um, disappeared. Uh, perhaps the technology gods did not look favorably upon his internet connection in the moment. Um, so let's go to Alice. We may come back to Jack if he comes back. Okay, can you hear me or am I muted? You're good. Okay. Um, just to request that this monitoring 
be um, specific and perhaps instead of just having a general wording that you know there should be site monitoring, um, include specific elements that should be monitored consistently. For example, I don't think the, the garbage was something that occurred to whoever was monitoring and is monitoring this project now. And I got the sense, I gather that the town hired Tig and Bond to oversee the installation. And I wonder if they were simply overseeing the engineering part of it and not noticing other things such as garbage and conservation issues. So they were, yeah, they were specific, specify yeah, they were. what the monitoring should include. Yes. That, yes, thank you. That's a great suggestion. And right, the, the tie and bond uh, monitoring was specifically focused on stormwater management during construction. They did not have a broader construction site monitoring role. And um, this, and that's what we're looking at. It was, it was stormwater management that they were looking at. And, but, but having like, yes, construction mo site monitoring to include different aspects of that in terms of, um, yeah, are they staying with it? Are they going with the plan? Are they um, doing within the time limits that are set? Are they monitoring, keeping trash out? Are they doing stormwater management? There could be a whole list of what construction site monitoring means. And so a specification of how frequently that should take place. Yes, yes. Um, Jack, um, looks like the technology gods brought you back again. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's your turn. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to suggest, and you may have already covered this, but uh, if there could be a more accurate um, timetable for the work, I, I, I was looking through some old minutes and I, he, uh, Ethan said, oh, three to five weeks. And uh, I don't know what he was talking about. I mean, it's, it's been months and months and months and months and months. So as far as how long the construction would last. I think okay. if, there, if there could be an accurate presentation on that, it would be great. Okay, thanks, Jack. And then Devlin? Yeah, just following up with Jerry's, um, the dust, um, like the rock dust and the dirt, I did get videos that I can share and I did contact um, Jamie uh, about that because it was pretty, pretty horrible. I have never experienced anything like that. Um, we have children, one with uh, respiratory problems. We couldn't go out. Um, I have livestock living out there. I was concerned for their well, well beings. Um, when I went into the woods, um, you could see the the rock dust settling on the leaves in the woods, very sparkly. So it's it was it's it's crazy how dangerous that um, that carelessness could have could be. It could have been taken care of by having a water truck on site, seeing um, how dry it was. We were going through a drought, um, and just being proactive about that and being thoughtful with that. Um, also, I wanted to, to touch on um, the company with their, their courtesy emails about work being done. It seems like they notify us after the work starts. Oh, this is a courtesy email that this is gonna be um, like when they started putting in the large pipes, um, they had already brought equipment there on Monday. We got an email from Jamie on Wednesday, like, oh, it's only, it's gonna be done in a few days. And it was like the following week where it was done. Um, so it's like, you're a little bit late letting us know that they're doing this. We already see what's happening. So it, it may be just to let us know. And one other thing with the Tig and Bond, however you say their name. Ty. Ty, Ty and Bond with the water. The, so they, they, they're only doing the stormwater management. Um, my, my biggest concern is that we are at a lower elevation. We are in a wetland. And when I look up at the valley, when I walk up my little stream, I don't see anything that is going to help prevent a big storm from um, taking all the, the dirt. They, they did, I don't see any grass growing up there. I don't see any straw bales or anything. Like they did all the black um, plastic, whatever, fencing along the road. There's nothing up there but what, uh, where the wetlands are, nothing to help mitigate the water. Okay. One more thing from the monitoring perspective. Um, if one, one thing that's frustrating about this is we, we have a contact who is a NextAmp employee that we can complain to about issues. And, you know, she doesn't care about our complaints, particularly. She yeah. wants us to stop complaining, but, you know, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll get on that. And then they do nothing. So it would be great to have somebody on site who's independent from that company that we could raise our concerns to. 
Um, and it'd be great if they actually had some kind of authority, like in the case of this rock dust thing, if they could say, whoa, like shut it down, go get your water truck. This is ludicrous that this is happening right now. Yeah. But, you know, we can complain to Jamie Stanton of Nexamp and she can, you know, do, do nothing. And it's yeah. very frustrating. Oh, they're going to bring a water truck out in a couple of days. So it's like, well, just breathe this dust in for another couple of days. Great. Yeah. That's okay. all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have um, comments or questions about requiring construction site monitoring? Other comments or questions? We going on to the next one. The next topic is um, requiring line of sight visibility testing prior to permitting. Um, that was the next point we had. Again, put your name in the chat. We're calling you an order. Um, I see Jerry and then Jeff. Um, so Jerry, go for it. Okay, yeah, I just wanna be on record as saying yes, absolutely. This one is really important to me um, because I feel like we were told one thing and another thing happened. And had we had line of sight testing, um, there would have been a whole different discussion back in 2019 um, before the project started. Uh, I feel like there was a promise made that we weren't gonna see it and that's not been the case. And now we're sort of backpedaling to try and fix that. So yes, line of sight testing, thank you. Great, Jeff. Yep. Um, I, I agree as a land surveyor, I'm gonna say right now, line of sight testing is expensive. It's gonna be something that the companies do not want to do. Um, they're gonna have to map the elevation. Well, actually there's a lot of good free LIDAR terrain data out there. so. Maybe they don't have to come to all of our houses, but you know, typically when I've worked on these types of surveys, you shoot the elevation at everybody's doorstep. You shoot the elevations of the road. You do this exhaustive topographic survey to determine, you know, what these site factors will be. And people prepare these drawings of a picture of a person walking out their door and what their line of sight is and what they will see. And you know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money. And it's a very good thing to invest in because I personally um, made the mistake of backing away from engaging in this process once the developers told us, you will not be able to see this. You will not be able to see this. We're building it behind this break in the slope. So you will not be able to see it from your house. Maybe, I think they said you might be able to see it from the road, but you will not see it from your house. And that was disingenuous at best. They did not have the data to back up that statement. And as a land surveyor, when you look at their plan, I sent this comment to the planning board once already, their topographic survey is not based on on the ground data. They had it flown by Coal East in 2018 and there are big holes, blank spots in their topo map. If you look closely on their site plans, there's contour lines and then blank spots and then contour lines and blank spots. Those are a result of, um, flying rather than taking on the ground observations. And when there's thick hemlock trees, you can't see to the ground with the aerial photos they're taking. So again, um, the level to which this was not done on this project is like so offensive. For them to have come and said, you won't see it from your house when they had no data to back up that statement. I think it was simply lip service to get us to just not engage in the process. Maybe I'm being a little cynical about it, but that's what it felt like. So to me, as an abutting landowner, um, this is probably the most important issue, maybe second to noise, perhaps, but this is incredibly important. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks. And anyone else want to discuss um, line of sight visibility testing prior to permitting? Questions, comments? Going on. To the last point of our proposed um, revisions, and then we will go to any other things that weren't covered by all this. But so the next is increasing the screening and planting and maintenance of the plant screen over the life of the array. If you would like to have a question or comment about that, please stick your name in the um, in the chat. Looks like Jeff typed quickly. Um, go for it, Jeff. So this, you know, this dovetails right into the line of sight thing, which is that because we found that once they built the panels, we can see them. Um, now we're kind of like, well, now what do we do? Do we sue the 
do we sue the company? Do we sue everybody involved in this because nobody protected us or held them to what they were supposed to do? Well, the current solution is um, they're going to be required to do plantings and that those plantings are supposed to make it so that we can't see it. Um, I, as an abutter, am extremely skeptical that plantings are going to be effective. Um, with the amount of elevation change, they're gonna to have to plant very, very tall trees to establish that. And um, so I, and uh, Jamie from Nexam had specifically told us that they weren't required to do plantings, which I don't think is true, but she, she specifically told us that. Um, so yes, more screening requirements, more line of sight requirements, more of all of this stuff would be so helpful to this process. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And I see Jerry's in agreement, but doesn't need to comment further. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this issue of screening, planting, maintenance of plant screening? Um, I'm seeing some thumbs up. Um, we already have. We currently have in our bylaw planting and screenings. We just this is the this was the thought of strengthening it, maybe getting some more specifics into it, um, etc. So. Um, and anything else about planting and screening? Okay, so now what I'd like to do is, um, are there comments or questions that are other possible revisions to our current solar, large scale solar bylaw? Um, actually, Alice, were you wanting to talk about um, plantings and screenings or? Were, um, yeah, I just wanted okay, to- Okay, go for it. Go for I it. just wanted to add another point going back to that pole farm. If if pole farms are going to have to be on the side of a public road, would they also have some kind of screening requirement? Good question. Good question. Okay. So right, the, what is the what is the whole footprint of the project and what are the screening requirements for the whole footprint? Okay. And then Jeff um I, I just wanted to share something about the pole farm, just kind of as my experience as a land surveyor. And um, when these projects come through, the developers are quick to tell you that they have to have that pole farm right there at the road and that the power company is going to require that. But I've actually seen some pretty innovative projects in other towns where, yes, the power company themselves is going to have to install extra equipment and they're going to want to do that right next to their existing poles. And there's probably very little that the town or anybody can do to control what the power company says they need to do. But I've seen some where there is only one extra pole installed and then everything goes underground from there and there's a transformer installed there. Now that might be an additional noise concern having a transformer there. I'm not sure that that's the best solution, but it, just in terms of the visual impact, it could be considered, um, you know, to require underground utilities to the site rather than overhead utilities. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there as something that I have seen. Great, thanks, Jeff. And that's a perfect example of where it would be fabulous if you could email us at planningboard at townofconway.com with any specifics about specific examples, specific, you know, what the designs were, what the towns were, any of that kind of specifics. Um, it's very helpful for us to have that information um, either, I mean, I assume everybody can do an email, but if, I mean, you could also mail it to us, I guess, but um, some, yeah, planning board at tanaconway.com. Um, anything else about this um, screening planting thing before we go to the next thing? Uh, Jack, did I see a hand up? Yeah, thank you, Mary. I, I just wanted to make sure, Jeff may have already addressed this, but I think evergreens would be where what you'd want for screening by the road or behind people's houses. Okay. Yes, thank you. Like a thick and, wall. Yeah, thank you. And one of the things that, um, that you know, wanting to recognize, is, you know, the planning board, all of whom are volunteers, is, and trying to gather information that it's very helpful for you um, that you know have found other information in other towns or other whatever to email that to us because it's not like we can go to you know you know a web one website that tells us all these things so if you come across useful information send it to us planning board attack conway.com and um right now i believe we have um evergreens in our bylaw 
Um, but what we are looking at is perhaps adding a plant planting list or something. We're, we're looking at how to, to do that. Um, other things about um, the, uh, any things about, other things about the screening or planting? Um, no? Okay. So now what we're going to is the other topics that have not been addressed so far this evening um, that relate to um, specific or general things about revising the large scale solar facilities bylaw. I see that um, Philip and then Devlin are, um, have um, things in this, we're calling this the other category. Um, so um, Philip, um, go for it, Philip, and then, um, then Devlin. Hey, um, so uh, Phil Cantor, 12 River Street, Conway, Massachusetts. Um, so the, uh, I, I wanted to just talk about the play, the, the, the ability of um, a, a revisions to strengthen the town's hand when it came to negotiating over the payment in lieu of taxes um, and whether there's a potential for a re revisions to do that. Um, and, and that's just because, you know, when, when for, for those that don't know, when the, it was, it's the select board's responsibility to, ne to negotiate that part of this process. Um, and that what the, we, we, it was, it was very much linked to what other towns are receiving um, for similarly sized uh, projects. And the, the, the towns that had uh, approved them first, uh, you know, in our area, three, four years before us, uh, got slight, got, I don't know, 10, 20% more per kilowatt hour than we were able to get. And the, the, um, and I, I the, the, pro, I wanted to have it linked to our tax rates because we were being asked to take the same amounts as other towns that, um, that we have higher taxes on. And I thought there should have been a correlation between that. Um, but, but our own lawyer said, you know, we, we didn't have a legal basis to demand more than what the other towns were getting basically. Um, and, and so that's what, we, so, so I, and I, I don't know whether in your review of all these clauses there was it, or whether a revision could state uh, a, a, a fee that, the, you know, what the pilot agreement would be rather than, rather than that being a separate process, whether the, buy, whether the process of them applying for the permit could lock them into a, a pilot uh, uh, agreement that it, it would be higher than what we would otherwise get. I don't know if any of that's possible, um, but if there's any potential for a revision to increase the amount that the town can get um, as payments for these things, um, you know, they still have to apply by all the rules. And I just wanted to say that it's always a pleasure listening to this board, this committee, the way they go about making, the way you go about making rules um, is the gold standard for the town. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, thanks, Phil. And I think Beth is gonna chime in about that. <clears throat> sure. I'm, I'm just, in terms of the pilot thing, I haven't seen anything referenced in any of the dozens of bylaws I've read, but I could have missed something, but we'll we'll go back in and take a look. Thanks, Phil. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And um, so then I had Devlin, it was Devlin, Alice and Jerry in the, in the, the order. So yeah, this is in our other category. So go for it, Devlin. Um, so I don't know if this is gonna be kind of um, with what we can discuss here with the, the um, wetlands, basically. I don't know if I need to basically reach out to the Conservation Commission and Bruton Strange, but, um, and maybe like have a group discussion, including Bruton. I don't even know if he's here or not, but um, my main concern is um, the endangered species that could potentially have been living up there just because they weren't documented in the mass, wi mass wildlife, natural heritage and endangered species program because nothing was registered. It doesn't mean that they're not there. So I think if it's possible to have um, a, like a scientist come out or somebody that studies wetlands and just do a walk around to see if there's potential habitat for endangered species before the project is built um, or if they find something, something can be done to hopefully save that, um, that animal or plants, uh, habitat, because there are 432, um, in uh, native plants and animal species that are protected under the Mass Endangered Species Act, 173 animals, 259 species of plants, um, that are endangered, threatened, um, and are of special concern. And we have a lot of amazing critters that live out here that need to be considered, um, because they are so rare, 
we might not see them and so i feel like um solar farms are going to be like basically like the palm plantations of like a the amazon and like the rainforest like we're just going to wipe out forests to build green energy that's all uh just i'd so. like to add that devlin specifically reached out to the new moons the landowner and requested permission to walk the property to look for endangered species and she was told no she's like why don't you go look on your own property and for endangered species so you know obviously us as neighbors have no teeth to do you know anything we you know devlin tried and they were like no we want the money we're not interested in looking into that and i love i, I love oh, oh, okay sorry so i got the point so the point is the question of could the, we require a survey of the property for um, endangered species or other species of concern. So that's a possible thing. And I'm not sure whether that's the kind of thing that can go in a bylaw like this. I think that I'm not sure with private property rights, whether we can require a private property owner to allow a survey like that or not. Right. That, so that's something, but what I'm hearing is that, that is there if there's you know is there the potential to add to our bylaw a requirement of a survey for endangered and you were mentioning wetlands but but actually there's it could be any not just wetlands it could be any yeah kind of creature okay um so okay and then susan yeah mary and the best practices um that was published in 2020 and unfortunately we didn't have this when we wrote our our first bylaw it says that um, one of the things has to be addressed in the site plan review, and it, it, it says you can address it. Locations of active farmland, prime farmland, soils, blah, 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 blah. Priority habitat areas and biomap to critical natural landscape core habitat mapped by the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program and important wildlife habitat mapped by the DEP. So, so apparently are... there, is, there is some language that we could put in that might allow might require them to provide that as part of their site plan. Um, but but that's just for already documented endangered species, if it's already on the NHESP atlas or the right. biomap. Right. Um, yeah. A lot of people don't care about anything, but anyway, <laughs> money. Right. OK, so thank you. So that was a, that was a helpful in the <laughs> other category. So Alice, you were next, and then Jerry. Yeah, I have um, four things. I'll try to be very quick. I know um, I don't want to take up too much time. I was glad to hear Phil mention the pilot issue because I wondered if all of these, you know, theoretical projects that we're talking about are likely to be pilot issues. Um, I am wondering how much you have checked with other towns and if there's like a, a general formula for figuring out payment based on the output value. I looked at the last two exhibits in something that um, Jeff forwarded a while back about this plan and I was shocked by how low the payment is to Conway for the amount of assessed storage about um, assessed storage value that this Nexant project is generating what Conway is getting per year is like worth the taxes on two large properties, two large houses. I was stunned. And so I wonder if, you know, how thoroughly you really did compare with uh, what other towns are getting. So Alice, Alice, I want to yeah. point out, I want to point out that the planning board does not have, didn't have anything to do with the pilot. <laughs> or it's a, that's something the select board and the assessors negotiate. So I encourage that comment, I would encourage passing that comment on to the select board. We can look at whether there's a way to address pilot in the bylaws, um, but Joe, and, and Joe, I will, yeah, Joe. Um, Alice, I had the same concern until I realized that was per kilowatt. That's not the total. You have to multiply that by some other number. If you're thank you, thank you for making that clear, Joe. I didn't realize that. Right, and then it's. I think it's. I think it may be something like more than thirty thousand dollars a year. I'm not sure, but so 
so but anyway thank you for that comment about pilot you said you had three three yes, sets of things. yes. What's the i next also one? wondered i wondered if in the bylaw somewhere you will be discussing density limits by neighborhood or by you know certain areas of town for example we up here in poland now have this large array we could really deal with having no more like that so are you going to address density limits. Are you going to address um, limits on cutting forested land? The, the array that we have up here went onto land that was not open at all. And it just seemed ludicrous that all that land was cleared for the sake of a solar array. That was sort of like paradoxical. My final point is I'm wondering if in all the research you've done on your bylaws, you looked at a Best, man, best practices manual that I saw mentioned in a Hampshire Gazette article on yes. February 4th by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Got it right here. Great, great. great. That was all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and um, okay, so we got what was density limits, cutting, forest cutting limits, and best practices manual were things that Alice, and along with whatever pilot. So that's what Alice brought up. Um, Jerry, do you have a, Jerry, you have, you were next on the list for comments. Yes, yes thank you. I think this um, goes along with what Devlin was saying and sort of one of the points, at least with what Alice was saying. And um, I think it also maybe needs to have um, a different scale. I'm not sure if my, what I'm about to say applies to something that's maybe five acres or five and a half acres, but would definitely want to apply to something that was a little bit more than that, 10 acres or so. But essentially what I want to say is everything that's included in um, the bylaws section 12.7, the community and environmental impact analysis and health impact assessment that applies to large scale industrial facilities I would like to see that these um, things applied to a large scale solar facility. Um, maybe not at five acres, but maybe at 10 acres or, or a different threshold in five acres, but stuff like a description of the environmental impacts of the proposed development, both during and after the complete build out. The description fo should focus on environmental resources most likely to be affected by the developmental proposal and on the broader regional aspects of the environmental impacts, including ecological interrelationships. You know, this kind of language is where, um, you know, endangered species are gonna come in, carbon sequestration in forests is gonna come in, um, you know, land use and that kind of stuff. And all this language is here in section 12.7 or article 12, section seven of the existing bylaws that apply to large scale industrial facilities. This also covers the hyd hydrological analysis, you know, for surface water and groundwater, um, and also covers particulate matter and odor and vapors. Those kind of things are all here in this little section of the existing Conway bylaw. So I'd like to see how much of that we can bring over into this solar bylaw. Um, and I don't know if that really needs to happen at the five acre level or maybe there's another threshold. So that's what I'd like to offer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then Jeff. Uh, yeah, I had a couple of comments. So one thing I meant to say earlier and it relates to the, the density question and it relates to just where these projects can be developed. Um, so one of the major limitations for these projects is they have to have three phase power to tie in. Main Poland Road has a major power line going down it. We have three phase power going down all, you know, this whole, the whole paved section of Main Poland Road, it goes down East Guinea Road. And that makes us feel uniquely susceptible because there are lots of places in Conway where you can't develop solar because the infrastructure isn't there. So that does relate to the density thing that where that power is available, you potentially have more development pressure. So it makes us feel more, makes me feel more vulnerable in this neighborhood. That's just sort of a general comment to keep in mind that, you know, you're applying these bylaws to the whole town, but they don't actually apply to the whole town because not everybody could be impacted by this type of development at all. 
I think there is some threshold, like they might be willing to run like 10 new polls to get to three phase, but there's a hard limit where if you're so far from the three phase, you cannot have a solar project. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up, one of the uncomfortable things with this project was the town's limited power to enforce wetlands regulations. At the CONCOM meeting, yeah. Bruton Strange said he wanted a hundred foot wetland setback. And the developers said, if you enforce that, we are gonna sue you so bad because your town does not have a bylaw, a wetland bylaw that has this setback. Now, I know that it's probably almost unthinkable for the town to pass a hard 100 foot no disturb buffer on wetlands because most people in the town probably will be afraid that it will limit their own development of their own property. You know, what if I want to build an addition and I have a wetland near my house? This is going to stop me from doing it. So typically, Towns, you know, even if they want to have a very hard time passing like a hundred foot no disturb thing on wetlands. What I was wondering, and I have no idea if this is possible or not, but could you have a solar specific wetland setback that applies not to all proposed activities ever, but to solar projects? Solar projects yeah. must remain a hundred feet from a wetland. Is that possible to do a bylaw like that? Oh, Susan's shaking her head now. I don't know. No, I, I said I don't know. I don't know. Oh, you don't know. Because okay. they what, said, what you I know, do. they basically said you would need to approve this by a lot town meeting. And since you haven't done that, you can't control us next day. Yeah. You know, we will sue you if you try to try to enforce that. So then I was like, well, if you could do it for just solar projects, maybe that maybe people would actually support that if they didn't yeah. think it was going to lock up all their rights in their land. So anyway, it got and, really nasty. The guy was nasty. Okay. 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 So one of the, so one of the things, so that's, thank you for bringing up that, that point. One of the things that we, one of the things that the, that the, that happens with all zoning bylaws is that they have to go through um, the state attorney general's office and get approved. And one of the things that um, my understanding is about state law is, is that there could there could be issues about something that's perceived as excessive regulation for solar um, with anything that we're doing in our bylaws, but that's something to consider. So something about so if we were to you know and this I don't I think it would probably have to be a different bylaw revision to make a to do the, like a hundred foot um, wetlands related one. I don't know that that's something we can do in a solar bylaw. It's something we'd have to look into, but if we were to say um, solar, solar um, projects have to have this kind of setback from a wetland and somebody who does something else can be this close to a, um, to a wetland, um, that could be, uh, there, that makes me sort of nervous about the, um, if you're singling out solar for quote unquote excessive regulation. So that's, some, that's a dance. And so that's something that we will, we can look at it. And I'm not sure in order to make a, I don't know within a solar bylaw uh, revision, large scale solar bylaw revision, we can make a change to something related to wetlands. I'm not okay. sure about that. That's just, I just don't know, but. And just as a follow-up, why I think it might be appropriate is because solar is built, it's sold to us as green energy. So one of the things that's so outrageous about these projects is they want to clear forest right up to a wetland and then call it green energy. And it's just as somebody who's worked in the industry, when you're working in the industry, it does not feel like green energy. It feels like you are developing and you are trying to make that money. And so part of what it is, is that these projects are sold as green energy. So they should be acting like they're green. I don't, yeah. that doesn't mean you can do it, but just from a, you know, ethical or whatever perspective. So okay. great. Susan, do you have something to say? Yeah, well, I'm just looking at some of the stuff that we've been researching when we've been looking at what changes we could make to the bylaw and Beth found somewhere. And I don't know, Beth, what, what bylaw this is from, but it's, an existing bylaw that says wetlands impacts the facilities, including the large scale solar installation and access roads shall meet the wetland buffer and river protection standards set forth by the Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act regulations and any additional local wetland protection bylaws. So it doesn't sound like we can have something that's specific um, wetland protection in a solar bylaw that's different from other protections, but we can definitely insist that they 
comply with uh, with 310 CMR 10, whether whether that's helpful or not. And you know more than I do. Um, yeah. So that's so that would be the question of right. It, and this could be something that if you feel strongly about solar impact on wetlands or anything else impact on wetlands, I would highly recommend you contact the Conservation Commission because I assume they would be the ones who would bring a, would bring a change to, um, to, do, to do increase setback from wetlands, to do that local regulation. Local regulation, right. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, I think, um, I don't think I have anybody else on my um, questions or comments that are in the other category than what we've already talked about. Is there Jack? I've seen Jack now. Okay, then go for it. Thanks, Mary. Uh, just quick, I, I, I believe there's already something in, in the bylaw about pollinator habitat, or is that in the Conservation Commission? I forget which, <clears throat> but I don't know how specific it is that wherever it may lie, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's just throwing a pack of the seeds into the ground and uh, sort of hoping for the best or whether there's any kind of monitoring of that process. And I, I think that would probably be a good thing to do. Okay, um, thank you. So, right, whether that would be in the, so that's different from screening. Yeah. That's yeah. different from screening, okay. And, and one of the things that um, we had a little bit of a discussion about this in, I think, a, pr a previous planning board meeting, or maybe I'm making this up and we ha I had a discussion with somebody else. But no, the, one of the things that's interesting about thinking about pollinator habitat is like that there are some solar facilities that do a combination of solar and agriculture. Um, that, that do some kind of, you know, make the panels high enough that they can grow something or they can have the sheep or the goats under it or the whatever. And so, and given that we're, you know, a right to farm community, given that there is an interest in agriculture and, you know, there may be, uh, you know, could be that there'd be some project that would wanna do something like that. And so if there was language that was about pollinator stuff, wanting to make sure that that didn't for, you know, make it not possible. Oh, chickens are another option um, that, you know, that make it um, not, you know, sort of contraindicated with pollinator requirements. So that's something that we're thinking about. Um, but that is, that is a good point around, um, around, and it could be a point around, you know, plantings or something, but um, yeah. um, Bob Armstrong, um, you had, uh, you wanted to make a comment. Um, Bob, you were not here early on. We went through a whole series of topics. We're now in this sort of other topics we hadn't cover, but you're, you know, go for it. What comment would you like to make? So I'm sorry I'm here late, but um, uh, uh, two of the things that, that have just been talked about. So one is the clear cutting of the Newman's property. The Newman's logged that property on their own before this project. And the logger that they hired left a real mess behind. And they looked into what it would cost them to hire somebody else to come in and try to clear out all the trees that the Newmans left on the ground and the junk and the slash and everything they left there. And it was very expensive. And they found that the easiest way they could deal with this was to hire Nexamp to come in and turn this into a solar project. So. I know everyone wants to think of this property as these people hired this solar company to come in and clear cut all the trees. And it's not the truth. So, uh, you know, to me, this feels like an important distinction. Now, I don't know if you want to say no one's allowed to clear cut their property in Conway. You know, I mean, to some extent, that, that's what you're talking about. It's not you can't clear cut your property for solar. You're really saying you can't clear cut your property. And that's up to you, Mary, if you want the board to do that, but that's what it would come down to. And, and, and the other issue, uh, what were we just talking about? Pollinators, farms, chickens. Yeah, no. Uh, um, anyway, that, 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 was, that was something that really just jumped out at me. Um, you know, yes, I, I, I am 
maybe more pro solar than many of the people you know here. But you know, I'm I'm oh oh I know the other one had to do with with the way that the conservation commission dealt with dealt with Nexium. Yes, Nexium came in and they brought us a project where they designed the project in hopes of cutting the trees down all the way to the wetland boundaries. And we said no. And sure, they they tried to huff and puff, but it was, you know, maybe I'll say their role to do that. Co the Conservation Commission does not enforce a hundred foot setback to wetlands. The, the, the Conservation Commission attempts to deal with people that if the only place you can put your driveway is near a wetland, you know, we will make a lot of rules about how to do that, but we will help you be able to build a new driveway if you're going to build a house or if you're going to build a shed in your backyard that's within 100 foot of a wetland. The conservation has its own, has, has the ability to apply the 100 foot setback in any way it wants to according to the state law. So it's not that, you know, we were run over by this project. It is the biggest project the Conservation Commission and the first big solar project the Conservation Commission ever dealt with, granted. But, but I really feel that they worked with the Conservation Commission on how much we did. We said commonly we enforce 50 feet. They said, okay, so. Okay, thanks, Bob. And then I'm gonna call on Beth and then Jeff. I don't wanna to get too far afield here, but I just do wanna reiterate that the planning board would have no authority or ability or jurisdiction to, to say that people couldn't log their property in town and that they couldn't clear cut it. You have some state regulations on, on forestry. You have some lots of possible options. You do have to file a cutting plan if you're cutting more than 20 acres. Um, but that's not our, that's not our, it's not even poss remotely possible for us to do something like that. And um, the only way that we can protect, for sure, the only way we can protect what we deem important landscapes, forests, wetlands, things like that in our town, uh, aside from you know relying on the Wetlands Act, which is a which is a federal act with with, with some local teeth and some state teeth, um, and things like that, is to preserve it, and to preserve it it might mean you have to buy it <laughs> or, you know, and we have, oh, we actually have a lot of that in Conway. We have a lot of um, set aside property. Um, just, I'm just pointing that out. And, and um, there's limits to what our bylaws can do. Right. So when thanks. When we run Beth. up against property. <laughs> right. Thank you, Beth. That's it. Um, Jeff, you, you had a comment. Yeah, I am also a licensed forester, and um, I did not hear anyone say tonight that they were proposing banning clear cutting in the town of Conway. I'm not really sure where Bob got that from. I get very bristly about those things because I believe very strongly in responsible forest management. Also, as a direct butter to the Newmans, I can tell you that as a licensed forester, they did not contact me about their logging or about trying to clean it up. They hired Lenny Roberts, one of the most disreputable loggers in this area to do their logging. And it is no uh, surprise that he made a mess of it. However, to say that the cheapest way to clean it up is to do a solar development is simply not true. There are many, many other options. And I just wanted to say that. Thanks. Um, Jack was next. Yeah, I just wanted to second that. Um, I don't see how you go to a botched logging jog to doing 30 acre solar array. Uh, it's a, that's a big leap. Um, yeah, okay. that's it. So thank you. And so I want to bring us back to tonight's topic. Tonight's topic is um, we have a large scale solar by uh, facilities bylaw and the planning board is working on um, getting ready to be able to bring to town meeting whenever that happens in May or whenever it happens to bring revisions to um, to our you know proposed revisions to our bylaw. We are going to have a public hearing about a draft of those revisions on March 24th. That's a Wednesday, March 24th, 7 to 9 p.m. 
Um, we are taking input. Um, we're taking input of here in this meeting, as well as um, really eager for folks to send us at planning board at townofconway.com any specific uh, comments and discussion. And so I want to bring us back to are there any other topics that we haven't covered yet that are specifically related to revising our, our large scale solar bylaw? Um, I see that Jerry, we have like, yeah, about 20 something minutes left. I see that Jerry and Devlin, um, um, and yeah, well, I just clarify again, the public hearing, we're gonna have a draft of here's what we say, what we're, th what we're proposing for um, uh, a revi revising our bylaw. They'll be, we'll take input at the public hearing, then we will come up with a final draft that goes to town meeting. So that, that's that process. But I see Jerry and then Devlin have comments to make um, related to this stuff. So Jerry, go for it. Thank you, Mary. Yes, so another proposed change I see, uh, I take directly from the large scale industrial um, bylaw that's on the books. And to me, it's the purpose um, sentence, which is the first statement, uh, part A of the article nine of the solar bylaws, where it says the purpose of the bylaw is to promote the creation of new large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations. And I much prefer the language on the uh, large scale industrial where it says this bylaw is to provide for the public health, welfare and safety of the residents of the town of Conway through implementation of a zoning bylaw and performance standards for environmental and land use impact associated with the construction and operation of large scale solar facilities. So I'd like, I'd like to see you change that language in the bylaws. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jerry and Susan. Do you have a response to that or any comments? Yeah, we, we, we've already considered that and uh, we have some proposed language, but I like the idea of perhaps adopting uh, some language from the large scale salt industrial um, uh, bylaw. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Jerry. And then Devlin. Um. I don't know if it was discussed. Um, I left to use the restroom for a moment, but just um, I wanted to throw out their slope, um, looking at other town bylaws, like what the maximum slope is and make sure that we put a cap on how steep of a slope that they can build up on will be, because I am concerned about um, what may happen, even though there's a lot of management happening up there who knows what will happen if we get another tornado or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's all the slope. Okay, slope, thanks. Uh, so this is a perfect time if you remember some other little bit of, or big bit of suggestions, questions, comments related to revisions to our large scale solar bylaw facility, solar facilities bylaw. I just uh, want to say that I'm part of the subcommittee that's working on this new language and all of this has been extremely helpful um, to know what things you are considering to be most important and um, what things you would support if they came before you in town meeting. So, so this is, this has really been good. I've been taking a lot of notes. Thank Thanks. you. And then Jack. Whoops. Mute. Sorry about that. Um, just a quick thing. I don't know if this is possible or feasible, but I, I believe this is vi pretty visible from South Ashfield Road. And even though that's not someone's yard, I, uh, uh, I'm wondering if there should be uh, a, a greater setback just for the aesthetics, uh, more trees, more uh, screening from the road, not necessarily someone's yard, but just from a public road. Okay. I don't know how people feel about Thank that. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Jack. Um, Alice. I just was going to re repeat a point that a couple of us raised in the last meeting that we had about the solar array idea. And um, those of us up here were concerned about the heavy semi-traffic going over the three bridges on Poland Road that are all in relatively weak condition and due for rebuilding. And um, just wondering if a bylaw can potentially include uh, statements about 
appropriate um, road access to a proposed solar project? And would you take into consideration the types of infrastructure that the heavy 18 wheelers would have to travel on a regular basis? Um, Beth, Beth, I think is gonna comment on this. I can comment on this directly just briefly and we can look into it, but I just wanna remind you that um, public roads are public roads and they are um, to state specifications as well as bridges that are often uh, inspected, routinely inspected to handle things like this. So um, I just want to, we'll, we'll consider your concerns um, to the best of our ability and within our own jurisdiction, but um, public roads are public and um, they meet state specifications, so. Yeah, so our, our you know, the, again, it's the whole issue of jurisdiction of the con, you know, the planning board of Conway has some jurisdiction around zoning, around various things, special permit processes. Um, one thing that, you know, maybe it's, you know, requiring in a special permit that, you know, they talk about how, what kind of equipment they're gonna need to bring in, how they would bring it in get more information about it and require that it, you know, that they don't do things that like are um, violating the laws, the state laws about, um, about uh, weight limits or size limits or things like that. But, but, um, but again, it's, you know, what we have is we, our ability to do, you know, to revise the zoning by law, um, not, I don't know that we have the ability to say you can, can only drive this way or drive that way, or I think we have to refer to the state on that. I may be wrong, um, but that's um, okay. I'm it's 844 and we're having a good time here and I wish that we could pass the cookie plate around more, but we can't. Um, well, we could, but uh, it, it would like mess up my computer screen a lot. Um, so are there other comments, questions, things to consider in revising the zoning bylaw about large scale solar facilities? We've got a huge amount of information today. This is absolutely exactly what this information session is for and I appreciate it. Um, I see Jeff, I think just added a new, his name again and yeah. Jeff, Jeff and then Joe. Oh, Sorry. Yeah, I just remembered one other thing. I don't know that this would be a zoning bylaw thing or just a general recommendation. Um, but, you know, it seemed um, like I know Ty and Bond was the peer reviewer um, during the permitting section. Um, Ty and Bond does not have licensed surveyors on staff. They hire out other companies to do their surveying. So my I was wondering whether this project was actually peer reviewed by a land surveyor. Um, it seemed to me like it perhaps wasn't, and it would be very good if it was peer reviewed by a land surveyor, um, because like I brought up that issue where there were holes in their topographic map. And it's like, that's something that a surveyor would have noticed and been like, how, how can your stormwater information be correct if your topographic survey is not complete? So that's my suggestion, whether it's in a bylaw or just the best practices to not just review the engineering, but review it from a land surveying perspective as well. Cause that's the quality of your base information is the quality of your survey. And your engineering analysis is only as good as the base survey that it's that it comes from. So. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Joe. Um, I, I do have a question if we have a few minutes. Um, Susan and I just listened to the uh, special permit process going on in Northfield, and that's about dual use. That's about raising sheep underneath the solar farm. And as you might imagine, the hot topic, one of them was the visibility of the site and of the fencing and having to look at trees that were planted to hide the fencing. Um, now, the state law says you cannot regulate farming. And it also says you cannot unfairly regulate solar. So like going back to your wetlands thing, I, I think if the town wrote a, a wetlands requirement 
that's tighter than the state law, that would have to be for the whole town. I don't think you could single out solar, my personal opinion on that. And so my question really is, how would you feel about relaxing a lot of these requirements we just talked about so that a farmer could put crops or animals underneath? This proposal is for a sheep farm with, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was going to be 600 sheep that would be raised under a 41 acre site. Yeah, there are three different parcels. Yeah. Three different parcels. Um, and the panels would rotate east to west. So they're, they're mounted on a pole facing, I guess they're in a row south to north, but in the morning they faced east and then they rotate all the way over to the west in the afternoon. So they go as high as I think in excess of 13 feet when they're yes. Yes. when they rotate. Yes. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Susan. So no, I, that's I, correct, Joe. Um, jumping outside the box, if we write a very restrictive bylaw, we probably are preventing farmers. And the other thing that would happen here is it's an open field. It's currently farmland. So when you talk about screening and hiding and noise, all these things become extremely more difficult, I think, in an open field. How do, they, how do you, uh, we talked about all the things we should do, and I think most of you are talking about this forest situation. What about the same arrangement in an open field? So Devlin, I think, was next. Um, Devlin was, I think, are you re are you responding to Joe or are you? Is yeah, I think I'd like to just put in a couple, my, my two cents on that. I'm a farmer, pretty much I'm homesteading and I've farmed in the past and um, I helped a guy plant some garlic under some, some of his panels. He was doing an experiment to see how it would grow. But, and I, I also have friends in Cummington who have a hundred acres with sheep and they were thinking about doing a solar farm. Um, I've unfortunately lost touch with them. I should reach out to them. Um, I think definitely there can be language put in to allow farmers to um, do solar on portions of their land. I think that would be a huge benefit because a lot of farmers are struggling um, in the world today. And I do support that. I think that, that um, there could be language put in to promote that just like there is language in other bylaws for other towns, for forests, for uh, acres of forest that can be cleared, um, acres of uh, fenced in area. I think it, it just needs to be um, decided on how much could be um, done. That's all. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Devlin. You. Thank you. Anybody else who have comment response to Joe about the combo um, farm and solar facility combo? Anybody else? You I mean, the, object the objections there, um, frankly, are from people who live across the street from it, who bought the land, who bought their houses and built their houses when that land was farmland. But, you know, if you want something to keep to stay in farmland, you need to buy the land. <laughs> yes. You can't you can't keep a farmer from putting stuff on his land just because it blocks your view. It's that's you know you, that's the hard part. I mean, I I I relate to that. I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to see um, a solar array on the Boyden's land at the end of Roaring Brook. But if that's uh, if that's what they were able to do with it, I'm not sure that aside from requiring screening and and setbacks and um, doing what we could to minimize the impact on neighboring property. I'm not sure how much we could do, to be honest with you. So that's, that's, it's a rock and a hard place here. Um, and, um, I think, uh, I think Alice, I'm losing track. It's getting close to my bedtime. Um, so I don't know if Jeff had something to say. And then Alice, Jeff, or... and then Alice. Jeff, and then Jeff, Alice. Jeff, yeah. and then Alice. So yeah, just real quick. I mean, it seems like um, by proposing, if if your bylaw did require solar screening along roadways, then that would limit the impact of you know if agricultural land was converted to solar. Um, but yeah, in general, agricultural land is extremely vulnerable to development. It's ready to go. Um, so that, you know, it's true that you need to protect it before that happens. And I would hope that if a special permit process was followed, it might actually give 
a little bit more of an option for something like that to happen. Like it was said um, in a select board meeting that like if we didn't like this solar project, we should have bought the land to protect ourselves or whatever. Well, we never had an opportunity to purchase the land. If we had, yeah. I think we would have loved to buy a couple acres from them, try to come up with some money to protect ourselves from that. But you know, it was, we it talked was never about it. A, it was never an option. So perhaps if um, you know the special permit process would allow more time, more input, and maybe some of the adjoiners could do stuff like that. Um, but for people to just say, well, you should have protected it if you didn't want it to develop. Well, we, you don't always have a chance, you know. Oh, you so, don't. You're absolutely so. right. You anyway, that's, that's all. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And then I think Alice had a comment. Um, um, yeah. Just seconding what Jeff said, you know, it's preposterous to think that, you know, if you don't like what's happening across the street, that you should have bought that land. I mean, that's really completely inappropriate. Um, but that's let's not, also say what that whatever we've um, talked about with our suggestions tonight, let's not undo them all just if we're suddenly then thinking about arrays on agricultural land. So please, when you're looking at the revisions to the bylaw, do respect what we have said tonight on the basis of the experience up here in this neighborhood. Oh, absolutely. That's why we're having this meeting. Okay. 100%. Okay. So Beth, I think has a comment. Yeah, I just want to clarify, if I sounded like I was saying too bad, y'all should have bought the land, that's not my intention. I didn't, I didn't mean to say that. I, that wasn't what I meant either. That was what was posed in the Northfield meeting today. Yeah, I, I, I recognize this. Uh, this is a difficult situation for anyone who lives uh, in a society with private land around us. <laughs> Our neighbors can do what they want to do. I mean, within the within the limits of the law. So um, well, you all know I live on Roaring Brook, and I would, and I had the whole marijuana farm issue. So I I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, we yeah. do. So um, I'm going to. Uh, so I apologize if I sounded cavalier. I'm not. I didn't intend that at all. Um, can, I want to. Yeah, Beth. Let's, can I, we're gonna wrap. We're gonna wrap this up. Is there anyone who has not yet spoken? who has not yet spoken at all in these last couple of hours, who has something that they would like to add. Jonathan. Jonathan. Let me mute myself, you can hear me. Uh, John Barkin, Williamsburg Road. Um, and I, the worst of our experience was the level of noise. We're at the bottom of the hill. And as those trucks came down the hill, they shook the house. Um, that said, it's hard to be anti-development and it's hard to be critical of solar. And I feel so badly for the abutters. And I was worried when I first heard about the project from Bob about what it would mean. And it would seem as though there have been some rather egregious um, errors made. So on the one hand, my hope is that we're all smart enough to have analyzed everything that went wrong. And that there is some place clear list of everything that has gone wrong such that each of those is addressed. And what I heard sounded comprehensive, but it's hard to know that in fact that list was generated. But beyond that, it's a very disturbing conversation. And I've listened to every comment and I've listened to you know every bit of information and it's a very disturbing call. Um, I just wanted to add that. Thanks, Thanks, John. Um, Phil? So I just, just going back to Mary, your initial comment about the planning board vacancy to remind people that the town caucus is March 1st at the grammar school uh, at 7 p.m. at the gymnasium, very socially distanced. You do need 25 people to have a quorum. We never ever get more than 30. Um, and the room is rated for 240. So it's it's okay. And even if you're not planning on running for the planning board, even though there are many people here on this meeting that seem to have an affinity for the subject matter, um, that uh, we still need people to show up uh, as just to, to be some of, to be the quorum of 25. So March 1st, seven, seven o'clock. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Anyone else who has any, who has not spoken yet that has a comment, a quick comment, in the last couple of minutes. I'm not seeing anybody. And I wanna say that um, 
I really appreciate everybody who's brought comments um, and um, and a big thanks to you know to everyone from all of us on the planning board. This is exactly the kind of information we wanted to get in our information gathering and figuring out how to propose a revision to this bylaw. And I, if you're like me, you're one of those people that tomorrow morning you're going to be brushing your teeth and you're going, oh. I should have said that, and I didn't, but it isn't your only opportunity. You can then like finish brushing your teeth and put down the toothbrush, go to the computer or the whatever, and send us an email, planningboardatanaconway.com with your, your brilliant toothbrushing thought. Um, and um, that, you know, and I don't know if we have a deadline for that, um, but, of when we need comments by, I can say that we have, um, it would be incredibly helpful to have any comments before our March 4th um, planning board meeting, because I assume that at our March 4th planning board meeting, we're going to be working on, so that's like two weeks from now. And we need them by like the second or third, because at the March 4th meeting, we will be discussing, um, like, you know, take, digesting all this information and taking this and turning it into zoning bylaw language, um, you know, revision language. Um, so, um, and of course, if you send it sooner, that's even better. Um, but yeah, certainly by this, like the second or third, um, so that we can make sure we get that stuff in. And then, you're, you've all marked your calendars for March 24th because that's when the public hearing is going to be. Um, and thanks, Phil, for bringing that up about the, the there is an open, uh, my seat is going to be open on the planning board. Um, and if people, if you, if you yourself want to talk to somebody about, gee, what's it like to be on the planning board? Or if you um, know somebody who you think, well, maybe, you know, Susie or Fred would be good for the planning board, talk to them. And if they want to talk to somebody about what it's like, reach out to us. We're happy to talk. We're a pretty friendly crowd. Um, we normally have cookies at our information sessions and public hearings. We can't with a Zoom thing, but we also have to drive through the mail. <laughs> so um, anything else? It's 8.59. Anything else uh, that needs to, we need to say or do? now are we are we there jack i'm yeah you unmuted yourself yeah i did for once no i just wanted to thank you guys i think you do a great job and uh you're kind of the envy of a lot of towns i would think thank you thanks yeah. jack appreciate thanks, it thanks jack that's very kind um that's very kind we try hard we try yeah. hard and okay. and really and to point out to folks that um i can say for myself i would not have been on the planning board all this amount of time that I've been on the planning board, if it weren't that it is. Um, it's been a great group of people all along, even though people have come and gone. Great group of people, interesting um, process, interesting conversations, really thoughtful, well-intentioned folks. It is, um, it's just, uh, it's, it's a great experience. So just wanting to put, put that out. Um, and my stepping away is because of work and other, commitments and because, and I'm going to continue to be involved as an associate member. I'm following, Joe is my role model. And so Joe went from being a full member to being an associate member. So I'm gonna go from being a full member to an associate member because I'm particularly interested in housing related stuff. And which is also to point out that if you like coming to these information sessions a month from today on March 18th, we have an opportunity for you and we're going to be having another one of these information sessions, and it's going to be looking at housing issues and potential um, revisions to zoning bylaws related to housing issues, including, for example, detached accessory dwelling units. Right now in Conway, you can have a you know accessory dwelling unit within the same building, but you can only have one dwelling unit on a lot. And this one of the things we're looking at is should we could we have a second dwelling unit on a lot? So that's the kind of excitement we're going to be having in conversation on um, March 18th. So if that's of interest to you, um, stay tuned. We'll be um, we'll be talking um, about that. 
um, enough, enough excitement for now. Go get your own cookies. Um, thank you. I'm glad that you don't have to drive in the snow or whatever, whether it's doing it yeah. out there or not. Thank you. And we're going to stop the recording now. Um, I'm going to stop the recording because actually we're going to let's officially close the meeting. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to planning board members and we're officially closing the public hearing. I move that we close the public hearing. Somebody want a second? Second from Jen. Jen. All in favor, aye. 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 Okay, so we are closed, closing this information session and I'm turning off the recording.